turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be ready for verses 1 to 3 as you can see up on the screen. Hopefully it's nice and uh, clear. <clears throat> Sometimes in our Christian world we can become discouraged. Discouraged with ourselves and whether we are actually making a difference in the lives of people we come in contact with. Um, one of the reasons is because we're probably not seeing the fruit of the actions in which we're doing. Or perhaps you, have, you haven't witnessed to somebody because you don't really know where to start. Today I would like to give you some key areas to focus on, focus your time on, and a bit of history about the disciples. But first and foremost, let's look, uh, read Luke chapter 10 verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the labourers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labourers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lamb among wolves. So this morning, what we're going to focus on is a few things. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest is where we'll be starting. We'll look at some areas of the Christian life we as Christians can focus on to be more influential in the lives of those in your inner circle. Um, then we're going to be looking at labourers into the harvest. So we will look at the disciples um, and the, the labourers that Jesus sent into the harvest. We'll then follow on with lamb among wolves and we'll have a look at how uh, Christians early on were pretty much lambs among wolves and we'll see who the wolves are and then we'll also have a look to see how that is applicable to us. Let us also remember as we go through the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the man of God shall be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? So always please make sure the scripture is utilised for our instruction. Romans 15, 4 says, For whosoever things were written before time were written for our learning. Okay, so these things are written for we can apply to our lives and um, and hopefully be influential to the people we come in contact with. So that, first and foremost, let's look at uh, pray ye the Lord of the harvest. And that is obviously from uh, verse number 2 of Luke 10. So one of the first things that we can actually focus on as Christians is prayer. And I would say, I'm starting off with it first because I'd say it's probably the most important um, because it's the most intimate that we can have. It's the most personal part of our lives and um, of our life with the Holy Trinity, with God the Father, God the Holy, uh, Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 6.6 6, it says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, or in a uh, New American it says, in a room. And when thou shut thy door, Pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which is in secret, shall reward you openly. So when we pray in our own time, it's important for us to close out all distractions, everything. If you have children, you might find that that's quite difficult. So that means setting an alarm a little bit earlier than you know the time that they get up, so you can spend that time in prayer unto God. That is where we get our power from as Christians. If you're not spending time in prayer, then you're not having that intimate relationship with God. How is, your, how is your life affected by not having that time in prayer? Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. All distractions, God. Focus on that time. Now, our lives are busy these days. I understand that. And you know, sometimes we don't have that time in the morning. Sometimes we... We might have to pray while we're on our way to work. So if you are taking the train to work, close your eyes. Pray. Put your headphones in. Pray to God who is in secret. And he will he reward you openly for those things that you pray for. One of the things that sometimes we can think about is like, you know, we have a certain amount of time um, in the morning. How often should we pray? Well, in Psalm 55, 16, verse, uh, verse, uh, Psalm, 54, uh, Psalm 55, verse 16, you've got to turn there with me, you see an example of what the psalmist is saying, how many times that psalmist actually pray, uh, prayed unto God. Psalm 55, 16 says, As for me, I shall call upon God, so 
a way of praying, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur, and He will hear my voice. So there's an example for us, if we're thinking about how many times should we pray in our lives. There's an example, morning, noon, and evening. And it's not that, and that's not the, um, if we have to actually have a look at the, the New Testament now, I mean there's an example from the Old Testament of what a lot of the Israelites prayed. From the New Testament, we actually see an example here in Luke 18, and we're going to read from verses 1 through 6. In Luke 18, verses 1 and 6, it says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Verse 2, saying, There is a city and a judge who fears not God, neither regarded men. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said unto himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. So first and foremost we see in verse number 1, He spake in power and said unto this end, that men ought always to pray and to not fail. So you can do it three times a day. Set up a routine and you can follow that. But Jesus is saying here, men ought always to pray. So if you're in your car, you're driving somewhere and something comes to you, Send up a prayer to God. You know, if you're, you're at work and the stresses of, of the work is starting to come upon you, take a bit of time, send up a prayer to God. Ask Him to help you in that moment. And if you have something that's really important in your life to pray for, maybe it's the soul of a brother or a sister, a mother, a daughter, a father, a son, send it up even more. Continually, just as this widow coming to this magistrate was constantly coming to him in order to help him with this adversary. Jesus is saying, pray, pray for these things, pray for these people, pray, pray for these, these, these things in your life. And he will help out the situation. Now we know that God won't force somebody to believe something that they don't want to do. At the end of the day, it's always going to be their, that's their choice. But he might completely surround that person with Christians. Everywhere that person turns, in their workplace, in um, in their sports, everywhere that person now is going, it's like, oh, meet another person, oh, I'm a Christian, oh, did you go to church? Lo and behold, they can, they're surrounded by Christians, and like, how is this happening? And then that person might go to their wife or their husband and says, I'm finding that Christians are absolutely everywhere at the moment. Praise God. Praise God in that moment. So how often should we pray? Three times a day is good, but continually, always, always, pound God as much as you physically can, pound Him. How long should we pray for? Luke 6.12 says, it was at this time that he went off to the mountains with Jesus to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer. Have you ever spent a whole night in prayer? Have you ever wanted something so badly, praying for something all night? I must say, when I pray, I can tell you it doesn't last all night. It doesn't. Normally, it's five to ten minutes. A few times a day. Where, how often, how long do you guys pray for? Is it a couple of minutes? There's, there's many things in our lives that we wish we can be focusing our time on and praying for. How long do we spend? Are we going to be like Jesus and spend the whole night? First Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Constantly in prayer. So there's one aspect that we can focus on as Christians. Our prayer life. Is it where we should be? Are there things in our life that aren't really going the way that they should? And maybe that's one of the reasons they're not. It's because we're not spending that time in prayer. Having that close off from around the world, uh, uh, the, the things around the world, and spending that time focused on prayer. Another thing that we can do as Christians is rejoice. So what is rejoice? 
So the meaning of rejoice in the Old Testament, there's, there's many different examples of the meaning of, the, the, um, of, uh, of rejoice in the Old Testament. One of them is the Hebrew word sus, and this means to be bright and cheerful, to be glad, to be joyful, um, to rejoice. But an example in the, uh, in the New Testament is car, cario, cario, and that means full of cheer, to be calmly happy or well off. Um, and it's a way of sal- it can also be a salutation in the greeting. The Oxford Dish- Dictionary actually says that rejoice is to feel or show great joy or delight. So why should we rejoice? Turn with me to Psalm 70 verse 4. Let's have a look as to an example of why we as Christians should rejoice. One of the things that we should do as Christians. Psalm 70 verse 4 says, Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee, and let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. As a Christian, you have been saved. What have you been saved from? You've been saved from a fate worse than death, and that's eternal separation from your God, the God the Creator. He that made you in His own image and as you do with all these blessings that you have, set you up in a world that is perfect for you to to, um, to live, to love amongst men. It's given you all these things. And although mankind has fallen short and and sinned against the holy and just God, He has sent His Son in the place of sinful man to take on your punishment. And that is why we should rejoice. Because as Christians, Believing in Jesus, repenting of our sins, being dumped, immersed in water, forgiveness of sin, washed in that water. We have salvation. And that's one of the reasons why we can rejoice. Another example is found in Romans 5, verses 1 to 2. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God, our Maker. Those wrongs that we have done have been washed clean by Jesus, not by anything that we could do, not by any actions that we could do, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, the only Son of God who punished for us. Philippians 4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We have so many reasons to rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5 16 says, Rejoice evermore. And so we should. So there's another example of one of the things that we can do as Christians if you know, we, we want to be influential in our world, in our family life, our work life, and our, with our friends. We can pray and we can rejoice. We can be cheerful, we can be glad for the things that God has given us. What's another example of what we can do? Well, we can study. One of the blessings of being in this church is that we have a leader in this church that actually makes up booklets for us. It makes it very easy for us to study the Word. We, you know, it's, it's all there. We go through a, a whole book in the Bible and he's prepared it all. For us to study, to learn, to rightly divide the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Rightly dividing it. We need to make sure that as we're studying, we're studying things that are, that are true. We've got to ask these questions. Are what we're hearing the truth? Because there are lots of people out there that will try to take that truth away from you or try to water down that truth or add to that truth. We need to be like the Bereans in Acts 17, uh, 10 verse 11 it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul from Thessalonica, Thessalonica and Silas by night and to Berea. And coming there, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, the word that Paul and Silas were proclaiming, searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So what can we do? We can rightly divide the word of God and have um, everything written down for us through the study and what Alan actually prepares for us. does a fantastic job there. We still need to make sure that we are rightly dividing it and being like the Bereans and 
whatever Alan has said in these studies, we need to make sure that we are doing our best to make sure that's true and challenge him where we think he needs to be challenged. That's what we can do as Christians. So we can pray, we can rejoice, we can study. So if we want to have an impact in the places where we are, these are the things that we can do. I have another example, and that is what we can do is we can listen. Now, I don't actually have a scripture for this one, but uh, one of the greatest things about living in this techno technological age is that if you want to learn anything about defending the faith, the amount of information that is at your disposal is phenomenal. You are only limited by the amount of time in your day. So listen to sermons that strengthen your faith, podcasts that discuss, uh, discuss apologetics, watch YouTube videos of others evangelizing um, to build your strength in the areas you are lacking. We have no excuses as Christians not to do this. It's all there. The Bible is in a nice, nicely packaged for it. We can have it on, a, on an iPad, we can have it in book form, whichever you want to do. We can listen to podcasts with all the headphones on the way to, to work, on the way to, to, to wherever it is you're going, you can listen to something. Something that's that's challenging you in some, an area where you need to um, need to get better. We can do these things. 1 Peter 3.15 says, We sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you to meet in this fear. If we do these things, pray, rejoice, study, uh, listen to these things, we will always have an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. And we will be able to do that for this day if we've been in prayer. Let us continue on. Let's, let's look at the next point. Labour is into the harvest. We're trying to make these, things, these sermons a lot, uh, a lot um, within the 30 minute mark, but unfortunately, guys, it's going to be in for a long haul again. Labour is into the harvest. Now that we have the areas we need to work on to better our chances of evangelizing to those we encounter in our lives, let us now have a look at Jesus's, who Jesus' Jesus's disciples were. You may be thinking, well, okay, I can do all those things which you've talked about, but I'm no way anything like Jesus' disciples. So who were Jesus' disciples? Let's firstly, let's look at the 12. Let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Okay? And it came to pass in those days that he went out of the mountain of Jesus to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. Once again, prayer before he goes out. And when it was day, he called unto his disciples, and of them, those twelve, whom also he named apostles. So he had disciples, more than twelve, but he called, he chose twelve which were apostles. And their names were Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotus. Judas, the brother James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Now, all those names seem normal to me. No different to Jody, Haley, David, Carl, Barbara. Pretty normal. We also know the jobs of at least five of those four disciples. disciples. There's a new one. Turn with me to Matthew 4 and look at verse 18. Okay, so the disciples, we may think that we're not as good as these disciples. They have normal names like us. Matthew 4 18 says, And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. And he says unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw another two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left their suit and their father and followed him. So what, 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 what job did, did James, John, Andrew and Peter have? Were they lawyers? Were they doctors? Were they nurses? They didn't have high paying jobs, they were fishermen. And we also know that Matthew himself was a tax collector. Matthew 9, 9 and uh, 10, 3, we see that Matthew uh, himself was a tax collector. <laughs> Is that any different to the jobs that we have today? Teachers? Physio? Clerics? No. Admin? Police? Are the jobs any different? Does that make them different to us? Do they make them any better than us? <laughs> we 
also know some of the places in which they lived. We know that Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, as in John 1.44. Nathaniel was from Cana, John 21.12. And we know that from John 1.46, Nathaniel said unto him, Can there anything good talk about Jesus? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says, I don't know come and see. So they had pretty normal names. They had pretty normal jobs. And they lived in what was pretty normal places. They weren't too far from the city, just like you and me. So just like you and me, there came a time when they needed to step out of their comfort zone. Okay, so they're no different to us, are they? Normal names, normal jobs, normal places where they live. When you, when you go to university, the first few years are spent learning your material of whatever it is that you've chosen to do. Teaching, physio, engineering, whatever. You will have the exams at the end of the block to put, that, um, put to paper what you've learned from the theoretical side of things. But eventually, you will have to put that theory into practical work. <coughs> so let's have a look at Luke chapter 9. We're going to start with verse number 6. And we're going to see that up to this point in Luke, the disciples have been learning everything that they knew. They've been, uh, need to know. They've been learning the theory of everything that they need to do. Alright? Now Jesus is going to put them out to work. So just like as a teacher, you need to go to your practical, you need to stand up in front of the class, and all that stuff that you've learned, you're going to put it into action. No different to being a physio, same sort of thing. You've learned all the content that you need to learn, and now you need to put that into action. Luke 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, and he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither stays, nor script, nor bread, nor money, neither have two coats of peace, and whatsoever house you enter into, there abide and men's depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the dust from your feet, for testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Here is a perfect example of all of those things that the disciples had learned and now putting into action. Now granted, they had miracles. Okay? Jesus gave them power to do things that we cannot do today. But at the end, when Jesus was going out and giving the Great Commission unto the disciples, what did he say? Go out into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What was the emphasis on? Teaching. Teaching those people. And then baptizing. Baptizing is an action. So not only are they they're putting the theoretical stuff into work, but they're going out and they're teaching people and they're putting their actions, they're baptizing as well. Okay, so that's this that's the 12 disciples. They were pretty they were pretty impressive. Um, they did have, you know, powers to do these things with Jesus gave them. In our main scripture that we read earlier, it was from Luke 10. If you'd like to turn there with me, we're going to read from verse number 1. It wasn't just the 12 that Jesus sent out, he also sent out the 70 as well. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, After these things, the Lord appointed another 70 also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. So Jesus was making sure that um, when he was sending these guys out to those areas where he was going to go later, they were expecting him. They would have been going out preaching the, um, the good news of Jesus. Mm, excuse me. And continue, if you look in, continue in, um, in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Once they've gone out and done all that, they actually ended up coming back and they had a report for Jesus. So these are people no different to you and me. They had names like you and me. They had jobs like you and me. Uh, they lived close to the city like you and me do. No different between us and them. And they came back with a report. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 70 returned again and joy, uh, with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us in thy name. What an amazing report. They put the theory into practice and they've seen the fruits of their labor. Luke chapter 10, verse 20 says, Notwithstanding, in this, uh, Jesus obviously tells them, like, you know, don't rejoice in the fact that the, the devils and stuff were, um, um, they could be cast out devils in, 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 in names. So notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, 
rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. As Christians here this morning, your names are written in heaven. They are. But you need to do the work. You've learnt all the theory, we're studying, we're, we're praying, we're doing all these things, but we need to start putting this stuff into action. We need to start everything that we've learned, we need to get in the game and do the work. I mean, this had a lot of incredible report. It would appear they succeeded on the first mission they went out on, those 70. Does that sound like how it goes with you whenever you go out into the world? Whenever you go out and preach this gospel, do you come back with a report saying, devils are whatever, or, you know, I've got a, a baptism of the first time I went in? No, it doesn't always happen that way. But we need to understand, failure is an option. Okay, you've heard the saying, failure is not an option. We need to understand as humans, failure is an option. I'm sure you guys have all heard of Michael, Jack, Michael Jordan, right? Quite arguably the greatest of all time, the greatest basketballer of all time. Won multiple MVPs, multiple um, playoffs, the guy made so much money, they're even still making basketball shoes after Michael Jordan. He had one of the, this is probably one of the best um, quotes I've ever heard on something on failure. Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've, on, I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to make a game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. We should not be discouraged when we go out into this world with the tools, the keys that we have, praying, seeking, studying, and all this sort of stuff. We should not be discouraged. When we start talking to these people and they don't accept what we're saying. We should learn from it. from what Jordan did. He didn't complain, he didn't whinge. He realised that there's areas in his life where he still needs to work on. The greatest of all time actually asked for a coach. I remember hearing a story about a, a coach that said he's going, to come, he's going to come in, he's a really, really good coach, and train these basketball players. He's expected to play to, to train lesser known people. The only person that actually came to him was Michael Jordan. Because Michael Jordan understood that as good as he was, there were areas in his life that he needed to work on. And he got a coach to help him out. There's areas in our lives that we need to work on, but we're not going to know where they are. If we don't get out in the game and play, you'll miss 100% of the shots you never take. 100%. You need to start taking shots. You get out in the game and start putting this into action. <laughs> Another great quote that I like, uh, I like music. From the little green man, Yoda. Pass on what you have learned, strength, mastery, but failure, yes, failure, most of all, the greatest teacher failure is. If you're always winning, what are you going to learn? What character is that going to build in your life? But if you fail, you know where you need to work, you know what areas you need to strengthen, and you can put those in the place. Here's an example of somebody that failed. You can see it on the board. Peter fails. Matthew 14, 26, 26, 30. Let's have a look. Peter tries walking on water. And when the disciples saw him, uh, verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is it a spirit? This is Jesus coming to him. And they cried out in fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee in water. And he said, Come. And Peter was uh, come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Save me, God, Lord. Peter put himself out. He put himself into the game. He actually played a hand. He believed in God and he played his hand. But then he started looking at the things around him, the things that were outside of his control. And he started to think that he's a failure. He, he didn't have that trust in God. And he failed. And this is countless in that times of Peter. Like, Jesus said to him, before the cock crows thrice, uh, before the cock crows um, thrice, you will deny me. He was one of those people that said, I would, I would, I would die with you, God. And as soon as a little bit of persecution came, he turned aside. He failed on so many accounts, did Peter. And that is why he wins. 
Jesus was there the whole time and he, you know, he encouraged him after those failures. I mean, he ended up going fishing after it all, went back to the job that he, he knew. And he failed so many times. But, turn with me to Acts 2.14 and we'll have a look at an example of where Peter wins. Alright, all those failures that he had when he was going through his apprenticeship as a disciple with Jesus. Failing, failing, failing. But given the crack. He's playing his hand. He was out there having a crack. And Acts 2.14 it says, Peter standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. And he's about to preach. He's about to get up there and speak a message to those people that need to hear it. Right? And he preached that message. He preached it so good that the, the, the crowd were like, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Peter said, um, Repent. Be baptized. Believe in God. And you know what happened? Acts 2 41. The men that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them 3,000 souls. Here's a man that went from failure to fortune. Not so much fortune as in like, money and stuff, but. Everything that he learned, he put into practice. Now he's preaching. 3,000 people get saved. What are you going to do? Are you going to play hands, brothers and sisters, today? You're no different to the disciples. Same job, same name. Just in the same places. You've got the same Bible, you've got, the same, you've got everything that you need. You're going to play your hand? You might be saying this morning, I'm too old. I can't play at hand. Get down on your knees and pray. Don't get on your knees. If you're on your bed, pray. Pray for those people. Pray for the Lord of the harvest. Pray that He'll send workers out into this harvest so people can hear this good news. Because they need it. People out in this world are hurting. They need to hear this, 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 uh, this gospel. And we are the only ones that can take it to them. Now, when you go out into this world and you start playing your hand, you get in the game, you've learned all these things. You've got to come up against wolves. You guys are lambs. This is supposed to be as gentle as lambs. You've got to come up against wolves. Mark 13, 9 says, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues. You shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before the rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. So Peter, John, Paul, all these people start playing their hand and start coming against some of the most hardest things that they have ever been against in their entire lives. Let's have a look at an example of Peter and John. Acts 4, verses 1 and 2. And they spake out of the people, the priests and the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. This is Peter and John. Being dreamed that they taught the people and preached through, uh, through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So as soon as Peter and John started going out and preaching this, they started getting people coming up against them. And that's what happened to us as well. We need to understand this. Um, the same thing with Jesus and the resurrection, uh, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. In, in Acts 4 6, Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, John, and the Alexander, and many were in the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. So John and Peter weren't just up against these Sadducees. No, against the high priests and these other guys, John and Alexander, I think were, were high priests as well in the time as well. So these are the kind of wolves that Peter and John were up against. They were the religious leaders. Seems like a pretty hard time for that. Let's have a look at another example. That's John and Peter. All right, they came up against it. Another example is Stephen. The wolves that he came up against. Stephen paid for it with his life. Stephen, uh, Acts 6, verses 8 to 9. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And those certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Alicia, disputed with Stephen. And yeah, they disputed with Stephen. You can see, oh, actually, I'm just got up on the screen. My apologies for those. Following along at home. Um, Stephen was before these wolves as well. 
And there's a whole scripture there. I'm not going to go into it because I'm actually starting to go over time. Um, Acts 6, verse 8 to uh, 7 through to 60. We see that Stephen himself was before all these people. He preached Christ crucified unto all those people. And eventually he was stoned. And you're like, Travis, well, that doesn't seem like a very good thing. You tell me to get in the game, I'm going to get killed for my faith. Thankfully, we do have rule of law in this, 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 this country that will hopefully prevent that. But there are nations throughout this world, countries throughout this world, where people don't have that. And if they preach Christ crucified, they will end up um, losing their lives. So those are the wolves that are without. Let's now have a look at the wolves that are within. And we have a few scriptures here. Um, Matthew 7, 15. Beware false prophets, which shall come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So obviously they are coming to you with guile. They're trying to, you know, batter you up. Make you believe what they're believing. They might be really boisterous and energetic in front of you. And they might be pretty, you know, you know there might be people that be able to persuade you quite easily with their doctrine. There's many, there's many false Religions out there in this world. Beware of them. They're trying to take you away from the truth. Another example for us is in John 10 12. <clears throat> but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, not those who's trying to um, shepherd you, to look after you, that's in your, in your best interest, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming. So this is somebody who. Um, Probably in your church, and honestly, you know, uh, looks like a pretty, pretty good leader. But when hardships come, when those things that are without start coming against you, they run, they turn, they flee. When the wolves start coming, we need to make sure that as leaders, we are there in hardship for each other. We're a family. That's what we do. Another example in Acts 20, 28 to 31. And this is probably a good one. Um, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. And that, as leaders, that's what we men are trying to do for you guys. Feed you, making sure that you guys are, are learning, <laughs> putting things into action that you're learning. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, and not, and not, and not spare in the flock. And also your own selves shall, shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you. Paul was a good example of somebody that was looking after you. We need to make sure that we are looking after each other, because the wolves can come from within. So, the fiery trial. Let's have a look at the last thing. So we've seen the wolves from without, so there's you know, religious leaders and all that kind of stuff that are affecting those people. There's wolves within, so we need to be mindful of those sorts of things when we start getting out there into the game. And we need to understand that when these fiery trials come, that we have each other. You know, we're supposed to be leaning on each other. That's the reason why when Jesus sent out the 70, he sent them out two by two. We're not supposed to be doing this alone as Christians. We're not supposed to be lone wolves, lone sheep. We're not supposed to be lone sheep. So we are. Those wolves are going to kill us. They're going to get after us. We're supposed to be doing this together by two. But 1 Peter 4, 12-13 says, Beloved, this is not a strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. <laughs> so these trials, these wolves are coming against you, and you're going through hardships because you just decided to get out in the game. That's what's going to happen. We need to be prepared for it. I'm not going to water this down. Hardships will come when you start getting out there. You will lose friends. You will probably lose family members as well. You have arguments with these people. It's going to happen. Hardships will come. But, be, have exceeding joy. The glory which is going to be revealed in you. Matthew 5, 11 and 12 says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you 
and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted are they the prophets which were before you. This is no difference. Alright, the trials which you will go against when you decide to put those things in. Obviously you've gone through the first few, few years or whatever, you start putting those things into, into practice. There's trials that will start coming up against you are going to be hard. They're going to be difficult. I'm not going to water it down. But, rejoice to be rewarded in heaven. That's where your reward is. And you also got to understand, though, like, you know, when you don't see the fruits of your labor, that's, you know, one person will come through and plant, another will come through and water. So you might not get, um, have, have known that, you know, the, the words or the, the work that you put into place has done anything in that person's life. Somebody else comes along, another Christian, waters. Another one comes with waters. Before you know that person's come back to you, you see him walking down the street. Oh, how you going? Oh, I'm a Christian now. I've turned to the Lord. Because of what you told me, multiple other people have done. Get out of the game. Start saving souls, people. We need to. So what can we learn from what we've seen this morning? Pray ye the Lord of the harvest. There's a few things that we can do before we get out of the game. Pray, rejoice, study, listen. We have everything we need to do this, guys. Everything. Everything. We have no excuses. The labor is out in the harvest. Who were the disciples? Who were the twelve? Who were the seventy? That would have been you or me. A fisherman. No one educated. A lot of you guys have degrees. You know, you smart people. You guys are just fishermen. They were willing to trust in God. I really to listen and put those things in their action. They didn't just pray, rejoice, and, and say it the feet of Jesus and not put that in their action. They got up on their two feet and they went out. Jesus sent them. And they learned so much. And they had they had wins. They had failures. Probably more failures than wins. But they learned a lot. And if, if you're going out there, you're going to come up against hardships. You're going to come up against people that want to see you put me out. They don't want to hear you. Like, you, like, it's funny, you hear stories of, about people who, before they came to Christ, how they had so many hardships, they were depressed, their lives weren't going anywhere, all of a sudden they become a Christian, they get disciplined in their lives, they start focusing on things, and like, people didn't want to have anything to do with them, they were quite happy for them to be where they were when they were depressed and stuff. They didn't say anything, as soon as they become a Christian, all of a sudden they have problems. All of a sudden you have hardships and they're trying to beat you down and saying you believe in baloney, you, you've been brainwashed to believing something that's not true. You start getting the hardships, and they'll come from family and friends. They will. I've got a little bit of them ahead of myself. I want to finish with one scripture um, on the, the theme beforehand. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. I'm going to finish with this and I'll close. I'll take that more of your time. I appreciate it. I hope you've learned something today. You can go away from here and put some things into practice. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. Jesus said unto them all, Any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily. Your walk is a daily thing with Christ. If you don't do something during one day, get to pray or you don't study and then you do it another day. It's going to be so much harder to get back. It's like going to the gym. You start getting in a routine. Once you get in that routine, you start seeing the fruits of your labor. It's the same thing with Christianity. Daily, you're going to take up your cross. Daily, you need to pray. Spend that intimate time with God. Daily, you need to study. Daily, you need to think about the things in your life that you can rejoice over, be thankful for. We need to do this on a daily, a daily thing. And now I will finish. Okay, you've been listening today, you've heard this message and you're like, Travis, I've heard you. I want to put these two things into practice. I want to become a Christian. What do I need to do to be saved? Believe. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord. He is the only way you can get to heaven. You believe that He is the Son of God and His sacrifice was enough. You need to repent. That's a turning away from your old man. The old things that you used to do. 
Those things are so easily beset you, you need to turn away from 180 and start doing the things of God. And you need to be washed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Baptized, immersed, not a sprinkling. It's not something that you had to do when you were a baby. You know, you can't make the choice for Jesus Christ when you're a baby. You need to be immersed. It needs to be your choice, not your parents. Okay? And if you're a Christian here today, what can you do? Pray, seek, study. Show yourself worthy to be approved. Go out into this world and start speaking to people you come in contact with. The more you do it, the more easier it becomes. And the easier it becomes to start seeing the fruit of your labour. Remember, people like Michael Jordan missed so many shots. And he kept on doing it. Kept on going. We need to keep on going as well if we are Christians here tonight. I'd like to finish there. I'll ask uh, Alan to come up and do the last song. And I think Carl will pray for us.